when you know what you're supposed to teach, and yet I feel woefully unprepared to, to teach this lesson. But I studied on it, and I know the Lord wants me to teach it, and it's important. I'm calling the lesson a clear and present danger. And of course, I feel weak right now. Yeah, but I'm okay. No, I'm okay. I just got to grit my bearings. The problem has a world. And in the lesson, we're going to find out that if you just think that you don't love the world, it'll catch up with you toward the end of your life and you will lose. And that's clear from some of the verses we're going to look at. Let's turn to start off with 1 John chapter 2, and then we'll have a word of prayer. 1 John chapter 2. And this will be the start. Look at verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now let me say right off that if you wind up being in the world and loving the world, but you're saved, it's not talking about that the Father stops loving you. It's talking about that your love for the Father is lacking. And when your love for the Father is lacking, you're going to have some problems in this life. And not only that, when you get to the end, you're going to be sadly disappointed at some of the things that take place. Now, there's two things. Number one, he says, love not the world. Then he says, neither the things are in the world. And those are not the same. Uh, you can love the world. The morning is... How do you stop loving the world? Seriously. Um, this world, when things are going well, when the country is right, let, let's go back 50 years when everything was normal. Okay? It, wasn't, it, it was a good place to be. You had a house, you had good neighbors. You had grocery store down the street. You had money. You could buy what you wanted to buy. You had an automobile. You could go visit friends. Uh, you had uh, you had actually had a telephone that hung on the wall with an answering machine. And those days are gone. Absolutely gone. Now, I have a cell phone, and I like it that I can call my daughter over in Papua New Guinea. And there's some advantages to that. But if I had to choose, I would go back to the phone on the wall with the answering machine. Why? Because if you really, really needed to get in touch with me, you know, you'd find a way. Those days were gone. The world that we live in now, though, the younger generation coming up, they know nothing about what life was like 20, 30 years ago. That's a foreign concept to you guys back here. You have no idea what life was like. You are growing up in a totally different world than I grew up in. And yet the temptation to love this world is strong. It's very strong. And we're going to talk about some guys in the Bible that loved the world and afterwards they paid for it dearly. Then we're going to talk about how do you insulate yourself against this thing of loving the world. Because actually, the world system with the government and all that stuff, I, I hate this world. But when it comes to getting out and doing things and going places and visiting people and having a good time, having friends over, having a barbecue, doing all these things that we like to do, it ain't such a bad place. Amen? You know, if you have a house and you have a nice soft bed, you can go to sleep at night. Uh, you have friends. You have neighbors that are friendly to you. Your car runs good. You never have to take it into the shop. You have enough money in the bank to go where you want to go, do what you want to do. You can go on a road trip and visit some friends in another state. 
it's really not that bad of a place in those terms. So we're going to talk about how not to love the world. Let's, uh, let's look at um, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Because money is tied up with love in the world. Matthew 6 and verse 24. It says this. No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, it doesn't say anything that's wrong with having money. The thing that's wrong with it is putting your love there instead of on God. And I'm going to tell you something It's very easy to do. Very easy to do. It's very easy to love this world as far as the goodness that God has given us, the nature, the trees, the stars, the sky, the sun, our friends. It's, it's not a bad place in those terms. But in other terms, it's a horrible place. Why is it? Because we have blinders on. Back, back when I grew up, I lived among the Amish people. And they had their horses and they had their buggies. And, and that was, it, was, it was interesting because the horses, they had these things on there. So the horse couldn't see this way and the horse couldn't see that way. The horse could only see straight ahead. And so they, they drive these things. And uh, they didn't have to worry about the horse seeing a green pasture over here and dragging the buggy over to the pasture so the horse could have, you know, a nice green meal. And we need spiritual blinders on because there's too much in this deceitful world to attract our hearts and attract our emotions. All right. Now we're going to go over to Second Timothy chapter 2. Actually, not chapter 2. I'll tell you more. And he writes to his protege, Timothy. And Timothy is a very interesting character. Paul loved Timothy, and Timothy loved Paul. But Paul, Timothy, his mother was a Jew, and his father was a Greek. And so what's interesting about that? When Christ died, he broke down the middle wall of partition between the Jews and the Greeks. So Timothy is a perfect picture of the church. He's part Gentile, he's part Jew, and God loves him. So, Timothy is being written to by Paul. When Paul writes 2 Timothy, he's in a place called the Mamertine Prison. And he's been imprisoned by for his faith. And it's, it's, it's a cold, damp, unearthly place. And he's in their solitary confinement. They didn't allow other people. And he just sat there. And while he was sitting there, he wrote this epistle to Timothy. It was cold. It was lonely. There was no silence there for him to sing praises to God at midnight. There was nobody that, that, that came to see him, at least at the beginning. Let's, let's look at uh, chapter 4 and verse 6. He says this, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul is ready to go. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but also to all them that love his appearing. So number one, you can kill the love of this world in your heart and replace it with the love of his appearing. Paul told us uh, in, in another place in Thessalonians, he, said, he talked about the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so get rid of the love of the world and replace it with a longing 
for the coming of Jesus Christ because the world will deceive you let's look at verse 9 Paul writes to Timothy he says this do thy diligence to come shortly unto me for Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica Crescens to Galatia so Crescens obviously loved this present world too not only that, Titus got caught up in this thing, and he took off all to, 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 to uh, Dalmatia. In verse 11, he says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with me, for he's profitable for me for the ministry. Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. Then he says, When you come, bring the cloak that I left at Troas. And I often wondered about that. Why bring the cloak? Because it was cold. It was cold and miserable. And Paul has nobody at this time to come visit him in prison. He, has the, he must have coronavirus and nobody's allowed to come into his cell. Or something. I don't know what, what the deal is. But he's lonely. He's tired. He wants to get out. And he's disturbed that he has been forsaken. Look at verse four, uh, Look at verse 16. It says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Now, I don't know what that would do to you. To me, it would devastate me. What happened? Here are all these men, Demas, uh, you got... Crescens and Titus and all these other people. They were Paul's fellow laborers. Look at Colossians 4.14. And we'll look at some other verses. It says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Demas was one of Paul's fellow laborers. Uh, look at Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. Marcus, Aris, my fellow laborers. So something happened to Demas and some of these other people. Demas got a bad rap in a way. Say, so what do you mean? I have heard more than a handful of sermons on how Demas just got all infected with the love of things, went out into the world, started going to nightclubs and getting drunk and doing all. That wasn't what Demas' problem was. Demas' problem was he liked his head connected to his body. He didn't want to leave. He was scared. And so Demas went from being a trusted fellow laborer with Paul to a deserter. And why was he a deserter? Because he loved this present world. Now I'm going to ask the question. If it could happen to Demas, could it happen to me? And what can I do to prevent me coming to the end of my life and there's persecution and they're going to throw me to the lions or whatever from saying you know guys I'm not so sure about this Christianity stuff maybe uh, maybe we can go out and get drunk in love with Jesus Christ and God the Father you are in a clear and present danger of forsaking God at the end of your life whenever that whenever that happens and who wants to do that? Who wants to have Paul, the aged, the beloved of God, say, Rowley hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And you know something? That is a clear and present danger. Now, why would, uh, you know, a, a lot of people will listen to this and they'll say, oh, that wouldn't be me. I love the Lord. I would never do that. The problem is, you don't know what you would do 
in any circumstance until you get there. You, you, you can't say, Peter stood up and said, Lord, I'll never forsake you. I'll go to the death for you, Jesus. A few hours later, he said, blankety blank, I don't even know the guy. What happened to Peter? He loved this present world. How do I know that? Because if he hadn't of, he would have died for Jesus Christ. He would have stayed with them, and he would have, and he would have fought, and somebody would have put a sword through him. It's one of the greatest temptations you will ever face. And who wants to do that? Who wants to get to heaven? And Jesus says, couldn't you just hang in there for another 10 minutes? <laughs> I loved you. I wanted to give you a great reward. You have forfeited everything that you worked for. Yeah, you'll be in heaven. But you will live forever. And how long will the regret in heaven last? I don't know if there will be any regret. Maybe God will wipe it out of your memory. But how would you like to live in eternity remembering that you denied the Lord just before it was time to go? That doesn't sound like heaven. No, nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. But I'm going to tell you something. That is a clear and present Danger. Well, Paul the aged, he was forsaken. Ever been forsaken? You've been forsaken. Being forsaken by somebody you trusted and loved is one of the most emotionally damaging experiences you can go through. It's horrible. You don't sleep at night. You wonder, what's wrong with me? Why did this person abandon me? Why did they reject me? I love this person. And you suffer. And it hurts. And it takes some time before you can actually get back to feeling normal again. Paul went before Nero, or whoever it was, I think it was Nero, but whoever that heathen Roman king was, three times. The first answer that he gave, and they, and they were taken out of prison, brought before the king three times, and they were allowed to answer for themselves. And after three times, if they didn't repent of being a Christian, then there was, uh, there was only one choice, possibly two choices. The first choice was this, you get thrown to the lions. Doesn't that sound like a delightful experience? <laughs> you know? Hi, lion. How you doing? Arr, you're dead. You know? I'd rather have my head chopped off or something. You know? If, if you have to go, lions doesn't sound like a very pleasant, pleasant way to go. And Paul says in Timothy, he says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion because he was a Roman citizen after the third answer. He, he was decapitated. But there was time in between each of those answers. There was months. The first answer, Paul said, I'm not recanting. I love God. I hate you. You're going to hell. He cleared the whole courtroom. They threw him back in the prison. He writes, on the, by the second answer, is where he writes Second Timothy and uh, gets his letter out. The third, by, by his third answer, he was he, he wouldn't he wouldn't change. Paul had the unique advantage of having suffered so much for Jesus Christ that there was absolutely zero love of this world in his heart. And so, if you're going to have zero love of this world in your heart, God is going to have to rip some of it out of your heart, and He's going to do that by letting you suffer. And so people say, well, why do Christians suffer? And one of the big answers is to get the stinking world out of your heart. Because God doesn't want you at the end saying, oh, I'm not sure if I know this Jesus or not. You know, uh, he, he was some Roman sheep herder or something. I, I don't, what would they say? Love not the world. Love not the world. 
Love not the world. It is an exceeding great temptation. Demas fell. Crescens fell. Even Titus fell. And all of the other disciples that knew him for so wickedly they were treating him and they thought in their minds now if, if I don't separate myself from Paul they got to sell for me and I'm not so sure that I want to go there what is that if it's the will of God for you to sit in a prison cell until they chop your head off that's not very pleasant but it is far better to do that than it is to say you know I'm out of this. I don't know this Jesus. I'm going to go back into the world and wait till I die. What, what's the choice? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now here's the catch. If you have things, nice things, God has blessed you with nice things. There's no problem with having them. The problem comes when you start to love them. I love my comforts. I love this. I love my vehicle. You know, it's crazy. People actually love their vehicles. That's kind of dumb. You know, you go up to your car and go, mm, I love you. But they do. There's people, they have a, a, a nice vehicle, and they're out there all the time, waxing it, shining it, getting it nice. And why are they doing this? Because they want their neighbors to say, look how well that guy loves his car. That's things. Things. Can you actually believe that the human heart is so desperately wicked that it would take the love that we're supposed to have for the Father and actually putting it on things? But we do. Aren't we smart? I've seen people move and move to another state or something and they're loading their stuff in the truck and there's stuff that they have in their house that is absolutely worthless. And so the husband says, let's throw this in the garbage. And the wife says, oh, no, that's been in my family for the last two million years. We, <laughs> we got to have that. That's crazy. That's a love of things. How is it that things like a boa constrictor, can wrap themselves around your heart and pull you away from Christ. Problem is, you won't know it for sure until it's time to go. You can live happily in this world and pretend that the world doesn't attract you and the nice things that you have that you wouldn't let go of if it cost you your life is wicked. Now, Paul is in prison and nobody's there. He's cold and he has nothing to do. He obviously has some paper and a pen they let him have so he can write, write to Timothy. But look what, he, look what he says to Timothy. Go back over there. And I want you to get a picture of this man's heart. In verse 11 he says, now, this is after his first answer, only Luke is with me, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable unto me for the ministry. So Paul still has a burden for young preachers, even though he's about to check up, he's lonely. The cloak I left at Charles with carpet, bring it with, I'm cold. Bring the books, give me something to do, especially the parchments, I want to read. Then he talks about the people that did him evil, Alexander the coppersmith. And at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray that God does make me not lead to his chart, charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out 
of the mouth of the lion. So it shows the mercy of God toward, toward Paul when they said, well, you're a Roman citizen, we're just going to chop your head off. We're not going to give you to the lion. And Paul bowed his head and said, thank you, Father. Thank you. What a wonderful thing to come to the end of your journey and realize that you do not love this world. That you would not forsake somebody that was going out who you loved because it was a danger to your body. Love not the world. Insulate yourself against the world. Now let's talk about some of the things that you will lose if at the end you discover that your love of the world has overtaken your love of the Father. And it, and it can. And if you are not diligent about this clear and present danger, it most likely will. How many Christians have got to the end of their life and realized that they didn't love the Father enough to detach themselves from physical items that wrap themselves around their heart. And then they die and face God at the judgment seat of Christ and realize that all of those things burn up and they're left with nothing but shame. It, it, will there be shame at the judgment seat of Christ? Absolutely. Who wants to stand up there and see your life's work go up in smoke while others are getting gold, silver, and precious stone and you realize that the world had wrapped itself around your heart like a boa constrictor and squeezed God out? You will lose respect. I think that Demas and Christians and the others realized what they had done and probably repented. I don't find that in the scripture, I'm just guessing, but if they did, it was the right thing to do. I'm guessing that uh, those others that forsook Paul because of a danger to their own physical life would, would probably repent, but the damage was already done. When Jesus Christ was in the garden, and the soldiers came to take him away. It says his disciples forsook him and fled. Why did they flee? Because they loved this present world too much. Now you say, well, no, Peter, Peter wasn't like that. Peter wanted the kingdom. If Peter was in touch with Jesus Christ and understood the will of God, he, he wouldn't have denied him. Am I, would you agree with that? And so, agenda of what we think is the will of God, and we do not love the Father, but we love our agenda, our plan. We think we know what's going on. We think we, got, we know God's next step. We think we know what's going to happen. And, and so doing that, we insulate ourselves from the love of the Father and cease to love Him like we should. Listen. We only have so much love, and it belongs to Him. Amen? Amen? And so we need to marshal our hearts and trust Him and love Him and prove Him and spend our hearts on Him, because if we don't, we will disappoint ourselves deeply at the judgment seat of Christ. You will lose rewards. Now there's a big debate among Christians on whether or not you can lose rewards. I think the inheritance that we get with Jesus Christ is settled. I don't think we can lose that. But over in John it says, see, uh, it talks about losing rewards. I don't know if that's dispensationally just for them, but guess what? I don't want to find out later on that I was dispensationally wrong and I lost a bunch of stuff because I was wicked! Yeah. Amen. You will have a defiled conscience. People that have an opportunity to do something right and they chicken out because they are afraid, later on, 
deeply regret that they chickened out because they look upon themselves as cowardly and nobody wants to be considered a coward but once you act cowardly it's very difficult to erase those things out of your heart you're forgiven by God but you often wonder what would have been the outcome had I not been a coward and I obeyed God you'll never know till we get to the other side but you don't want to come to the end of life and find out that you love this world more than you love God there's going to be a loss of spiritual freedom and why do I say that spiritual freedom means this I have a spirit that is free to worship God free to pray to God I have absolute freedom of spirit in Jesus Christ you can lose that freedom and put yourself back under bondage even though you are still free spiritually your mind will tell you that you lost and Satan will deceive you into thinking that you are basically worthless I know Christians that have done wicked things and they they keep on bringing it up over and over and over and they think that they're no good anymore they're worthless and they give up you lose your first love when you get saved you naturally fall in love with Jesus Christ it's a natural thing it's just like when you met your wife or your husband or, or your girlfriend or whoever it was and God put a love in your heart for that person God put, Father puts a love for Jesus Christ for his son this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased love him for what he's done folks you lose your relationship with the Lord loving this world listen the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon now I'm uh, that's talking specifically about money but let me tell you something money is the standard for material things in this world if you have a lot of money you got to be careful that God is in control because it will get a hold of your heart if you are not very very careful and then when you get to the end God says why did you love that money more than you loved me I would have used you I would have used you to bless other people help other people no you hoarded it all to yourself because you loved it not good in John first John 5 19 it says about this world the whole world lieth in glory is that what it says the whole world lieth in peace no the whole world lieth in good things how about the whole world lieth in wickedness and so when Satan tempts you to love this world he is tempting you to be an idolater and to put your love into something that God has deemed wicked love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love this world the love of the father is not in him you will destroy your relationship with Christ because you cannot love things you cannot love this world and God at the same time crucify the flesh is it easy to do no <laughs> it's not easy to do I want to live I don't want to die now I know I'm dying and it's okay but the, the the important thing is that you get this world out of your heart because when it comes time to quit you don't want to drag the things of this world into heaven they say you can't do that you can do it in your mind and your heart and God will say to you I gave you all this stuff why did you love it instead of me he will ask that question 
Now, what are some of the antidotes to this clear and present danger? Look at 1 John chapter 5. I'm almost done. 1 John chapter 5. Let's look at verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So you can't even get started on this until you're saved. And look over at uh, uh, verse 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know the Son of us come, and giveth us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And then a little P.S. at the end. Little children, keep yourself from idols. What's anything? that comes between you and your God. Amen. And if it's going to, you need to say, I don't need this, I don't want this, let me out, I don't want any of this. Let's look at chapter 3 and verse 13. It said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So now, what has switched? We prove our love to God by our love for one another. That's how we prove our love for God. We don't necessarily prove our love for God for how much we abstain from this world, although that we need to do that. You can be negative and say, I don't have the world in my heart. It's not going to affect me. It's not going to bother me. But if you don't love your brother as you love Jesus Christ, the world has got you deceived. This is his will, that we love one another fervently. So Jesus said to Paul, what? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He was persecuting Christians. So we have to learn what? To love one another. Um, chapter, did I did? Let's, let's look at chapter 5 and verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so I would strongly recommend that you develop a pattern in your life of seeking the Lord. And, okay. Yeah. But when you sense, and the Holy Spirit will let you know, He will give you a sense of what's going on. When you sense, that you are trying to hold on just a little too tight, then spend some time with God and ask Him to take this world out of your heart. Make it a priority not to love this world. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you don't catch it now, it's like a virus. It'll spread. It'll get in your heart. It'll get in the little cracks and crevices of your heart, the spiritual part. And you'll discover that uh, it's very, very difficult to get that stuff out because it wraps itself tight around your heart and you do not want to get rid of it. Love of this world and things of this world is a very, very deceptive thing. It'll deceive you. It'll make you think you're spiritual when in reality your heart is tied up in things and the love of this present system where you can go to the grocery store, buy some T-bone steak, sit down with your family, enjoy that with a nice soft baked potato with lots of butter and green beans and biscuits and all this stuff and say, this life ain't so bad. And that's not the bad part about it. The bad part about it is when you let that become your God rather than God himself. Make sure that you keep up your relationship with God, 
with his son Jesus Christ and ask him to make you very sensitive to anything in this world that tries to take the place of the Father's love. Because we cannot afford to get to heaven and find out that although we thought we were spiritual, we thought we were, we were Paul's companions. We ministered with him. We walked with him. We preached the gospel. And at the end have say, Rowley hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Father in heaven, grant us that this world may have less and less attraction to us and your love more and more attraction. So Father, when it comes time to go, whether it's natural, whether it's through persecution, no, no matter how it is that we exit this life into eternal glory, that when we get there, we will find out that the world had very, very little part of our hearts because it's a curse and it's a clear and present danger, Father. We ask you to protect us from it and take the world out of our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Take a break.